Hey everyone, Mr. O here, um, back with the Phantom Tollbooth and ready to dive into chapter five. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get a video out yesterday. I was experiencing some throat discomfort and it was difficult for me to talk loud enough for my microphone to hear me. Um, so I decided to, to not push it and to rest, drink a lot of fluids, and so this morning I woke up feeling a lot better. So um, I'm back here in the classroom and you might recognize where I am sitting. I'm in our peace area, um, in our really comfortable peace chair, which you can't see, but it's right below me, supporting my weight. Um, right here we have um, a map of the world with some postcards that students have sent to us from various trips of theirs, from South America, different places in North America, Central America, Europe, few in Asia. Um, and really interesting enough, today I have been watering the plants in the classroom while we've been gone, but this one is starting to bloom. So I'm gonna put it right back where it was because I don't want to change anything that might stop its bloom. Because when succulents bloom, it's sometimes it's a really rare occurrence. Um, and they're always very beautiful. So I will be sure to continue to show you its progress through these videos. All right. Well, we're going to jump back into Chapter 5. Chapter 4 ended with a lot of confusion in the word market. Um, perhaps you recall the spelling bee and the humbug kind of got into an altercation. They didn't really solve their conflict uh, as respectfully and appropriately as I know you would in the classroom, and I, I hope you also solve your conflicts that way at home. Um, but the conflict led to the humbug falling into a stall, which fell into another stall, into another stall, into another stall, into another stall, and before you know it, all of the stalls and all of the words in the world are on the ground, out of order, no longer um, easily accessed, and a lot of confusion has ensued. So let's pick back up. Chapter 5, Short Shrift. Done what you've looked, angrily shouted one of the salesmen. He meant to say, look what you've done. But the words had gotten so hopelessly mixed up that no one could make any sense at all. Do going to we what are, complained another, as everyone set about straightening up, straightening things up as well as they could. The salesperson meant to say, what are we going to do? For several minutes, no one spoke an understandable sentence, which added greatly to the confusion. As soon as possible, however, the stalls were righted, and the words swept into one, one large pile for sorting. The spelling bee, who was quite upset by the whole affair, had flown off in a huff, and just as Milo got to his feet, the entire police force of Dictionopolis appeared, loudly blowing his whistle. Now we'll get to the bottom of this, he heard someone say. Here comes Officer Shrift. Striding across the square, was the shortest policeman Milo had ever seen. He was scarcely two feet tall and almost twice as wide. He wore a blue uniform with white belt and gloves, a peaked cap, and a very fierce expression. He continued blowing the whistle until his face was beet red, stopping only long enough to shout, You're guilty! You're guilty! at everyone he passed. I've never seen anyone so guilty! he said as he reached Milo. Then, turning towards Tok, who was still ringing loudly, he said, Turn off that dog! It's disrespectful to sound your alarm in the presence of a policeman. He made a careful note of that in his black book and strode up and down, his hands clasped behind his back, surveying the wreckage in the marketplace. Very pretty, very pretty, he scowled. Who's responsible for all of this? Speak up, or I'll arrest the lot of you. There was a long silence. Since hardly anybody had actually seen what happened, no one spoke. You! 
said the policeman, pointing an accusatory finger at the humbug, who was brushing himself off and straightening his hat. You, sir, you look suspicious to me. The startled humbug dropped his cane and nervously replied, Let, let me assure you, sir, on my honor as a gentleman, I was merely an innocent bystander, minding my own business, enjoying the stimulating sights and sounds of the world of commerce, when this young lad... Ah! Uh -huh! interrupted Officer Shrift, making another note in his little book. Just as I thought, boys are always the cause of everything! Pardon me, insisted the humbug, but... I in no way meant to imply that silence, thundered the policeman, pulling himself to full height and glaring menacing, menacingly at the terrified bug. And now, he continued, speaking to Milo, where were you on the night of July 27th? What does that have to do with it? Asked Milo. It's my birthday, that's what, said the policeman as he, as he entered forgot my birthday in his little book. Boys always forget other people's birthdays. You have committed the following crimes, he continued. Having a dog with an unauthorized alarm, sowing confusion, upsetting the apple cart, wreaking havoc, and mincing words. Now see here, growled Tok angrily. Oh, and illegal barking, he added, frowning at the watchdog. It's against the law to bark without using the barking meter. Are you ready to be sentenced? Only a judge can sentence you, said Milo, who remembered reading that in one of his school books. Good point, replied the policeman, taking off his cap and putting on a black robe. I am also the judge. Now, would you like a long or a short sentence? Mm, a short one, if you please, replied Milo. Good said the judge, rapping his gavel three times. I always have trouble remembering long ones. How about, I am? That's the shortest sentence I know. Everyone agreed that it was a very fair sentence, and the judge continued, there will also be a small additional penalty of six million years in prison. Case closed, he pronounced, rapping his gavel, his gavel again. Come with me. I'll take you to the dungeon. Only a jailer can put you in a prison, offered Milo, quoting the same book. Good point, said the judge, removing his robe and taking out a large bunch of keys. I am also the jailer. And with that, he led them away. Keep your chin up, shouted the humbug. Maybe they'll take a million years off for good behavior. The heavy prison door swung back slowly, and Milo and Tok followed Officer Shrift down a long black corridor, lit by only an occasional flickering candle. Watch the steps, advised the policeman as they started down a steep circular staircase. The air was dank and musty, like the smell of wet blankets, and the massive stone walls were slimy to the touch. Down and down they went until they arrived at another door even heavier and stronger looking than the first. A cobweb brushed across Milo's face, and he shuddered. You'll find it quite pleasant here, chuckled the policeman as he slid the bolt back and pushed the door open with a screech and a squeak. Not much company, but you can always chat with the witch. The witch? trembled Milo. Yes, she's been here a long time, he said starting along another corridor. In a few more minutes, they had gone through three other doors, across a narrow footbridge, down two more corridors and another stairway, and stood finally in front of a small cell door. This is it, said the policeman. All the comforts of home. The door opened and then shut, and Milo and Tok found themselves in a high vaulted cell with two tiny windows halfway up the wall. See you in six million years, said Officer Shrift, and the sound of his footsteps grew fainter and fainter until it wasn't heard at all. It looks serious, doesn't it, Talk? said Milo very sadly. 
Oh, it certainly does, the dog replied, sniffing around to see what their new home was like. I don't know what we're going to do for all that time. We don't even have a checkerboard or a box of crayons. Don't worry, growled Tok, raising one paw assuringly. Something will turn up. Here, wind me, will ya? I'm turning, I'm beginning to run down. You know something, Tok, Milo said as he wound up the dog. You can get in a lot of trouble for mixing up words or just not knowing how to spell them. If we ever get out of here, I'm going to make sure to learn all about them. A very commendable ambition, young man, said a small voice from across the cell. Milo looked up, very surprised, and noticed for the first time in the half-light of the room a pleasant-looking old lady, quietly knitting and rocking. Hello, Milo said. How do you do? She replied. Uh, you'd better be careful, Milo advised. I understand there's a witch somewhere in here. I am she, the old lady answered casually and pulled her shawl a little closer around her shoulders. Milo jumped back in fright and quickly grabbed Tok to make sure that his alarm didn't go off, for he knew how much witches hate loud noises. <laughs> Don't be frightened, she laughed. I'm not a witch. I'm a witch. Oh, said Milo, because he couldn't think of anything else to say. I'm faintly macabre, the not-so-wicked witch, she continued, and I'm certainly not going to harm you. What's a witch? asked Milo, releasing Tok and stepping a little closer. Well said the old lady, just as a rat scurried across her foot. I am the king's great aunt. For years and years, I was in charge of choosing which words were to be used for all occasions, which ones to say and which ones not to say, which ones to write and which ones not to write. As you can well imagine, with all the thousands to choose from, it was a most important and responsible job. I was given the title of official witch, which made me very proud and happy. At first, I did my best to make sure that only the most proper and fitting words were used. Everything was said clearly and simply, and not a word was wasted. I had signs posted all over the palace and marketplace which said, Brevity is the soul of wit. But power corrupts, and soon I grew miserly and chose fewer and fewer words, trying to keep as many as possible for myself. I had new, new signs posted, which read, An ill-chosen word is the fool's messenger. Soon, sales began to fall off in the market. The people were afraid to buy as many words as before, and hard times came to the kingdom. But still, I grew more and more miserly, Soon there were so few words chosen that hardly anything could be said, and even casual conversation became difficult. Again, I had new signs posted which said, Speak fitly or be silent wisely. And finally, I had these replaced by ones which simply read, Silence is golden. All talk stopped. No words were sold, the marketplace closed down, and the people grew poor and disconsolate. When the king saw what had happened, he became furious and had me cast into this dungeon where you see me now, an older and wiser woman. That was many, many years ago, she continued, but they never appointed a new witch, and that explains why today people use as many words as they can and think themselves very wise for doing so. For always remember that while it is wrong to use too few words, it is often far worse to use too many. When she'd finished, she sighed deeply and patted Milo gently on the shoulder and began knitting once again. And have you been down here ever since? Asked Milo sympathetically. Yes, she replied sadly. 
most people have forgotten me entirely, or they remember me wrongly as a witch, not a witch. But it matters not, it matters not, she went on unhappily, for they are equally frightened of both. I don't find you frightening, said Milo, and Talk wagged his tail in agreement. Thank you very much, said Faintly Macabre. You may call me Aunt Faintly. Here, have a punctuation mark. She held out a box of sugar-coated question marks, periods, commas, and exclamation points. That's all I get to eat now. Well, when I get out of here, I'm going to help you, Milo declared forcefully. That's very nice of you, she replied. But the only thing that can help me is the return of rhyme and reason. The return of what? asked Milo. Rhyme and reason, she repeated. But that's another long story, and you may not want to hear it. We would like to very much, replied Tok. We really would, agreed Milo, and as the witch rocked slowly back and forth, she told them this story. We'll hear that story next time in Chapter 6. So, Chapter 5, we met a few new characters. Um, one of them I found very interesting, and that individual was the policeman judge jailer. This individual wears many hats. It must be difficult transitioning in and out of all of those roles. Um, but one of the interesting things that, that the judge does in Chapter 5 is he sentences Milo and Talk to a short sentence. Uh, we could also call it a simple sentence. And it got me thinking about our animals and their sounds work. So before we get to that, though, I just want to review what it takes for a sentence to be complete or to be whole. So for a sentence to be complete, a sentence needs two things. One, it needs a subject. There must be someone or something that is in the sentence, and it also needs a predicate. So, a subject and a predicate. Now, for your sake, we can think about our subject as a part of speech you're familiar with. How about a noun? I'll put it in parentheses above. A noun. We need a person, place, or thing in our sentence, and we also need a verb. So to be complete, a sentence needs a noun, also known as a subject, and a verb, also known as a predicate. So, our animals and their sounds work involves starting with simple sentences that just have a noun and a verb, or a subject and a predicate, and then it involves making them juicy, giving them lots of rich details that paints a very vivid picture in your mind. So, to show this work, I'm gonna need to adjust my setup here, so give me one moment, please. All right, that's, that should be enough. So now I'm gonna look at my animals and their sounds sheet, and that should look familiar to those of you in the dogwood community. And I'm gonna choose my favorite animal and their sound. Let's see. Ooh, I love this one especially right now. Owl's hoot. So let me just write that, owl's hoot. Owls hoot. Is that a sentence? Well, earlier we reviewed 
A sentence must have a subject or a noun, a predicate or a verb. So in this series of words, is there an action or a, vo a verb? Yeah, hoot. You can picture or think of or imagine an animal hooting. That is an action. So hoot is a verb, also known as a predicate. And who or what hoots? Well, owls do, of course. So we do have a subject, and in this case, it is a plural noun. But this doesn't really look like a sentence, does it? What's it missing? Well, all sentences begin with a capital letter, and all sentences need to end with an ending punctuation mark. In this case, a period. So let me go ahead and rewrite it now, making it look more like a complete sentence. Owls hoot. Well, there you have it. I have a sentence. But is that sentence juicy? Does it have so many details that it just paints a vivid picture in your mind? I don't know about you. My mind wants more. So, let me first think about the owls. How can I describe the owls? The nocturnal owls? Ooh, I know owls are nocturnal. They come out at night. I'm going to add some more details to my sentence. The, that's an article, a, an, and the, or are others. The nocturnal, nocturnal, three syllables, the nocturnal owls hoot. All right, our sentence is getting juicier. We don't just have owls hoot, but now we, we can picture more of it. The nocturnal owls hoot. Let's see if we can make the predicate juicier, add some rich details to it. So how do the nocturnal owls hoot? Maybe they hoot loudly. Maybe they, ho they hoot soothingly. How about, I'm gonna stick with loudly. So, time to modify my sentence again. The nocturnal owls hoot loudly Hmm, where do they hoot loudly? In the treetops. All right, so what began as a very simple sentence, the owl's, owl's hoot, started to get more and more complex, started to add more details to it. So it evolved first into the nocturnal owl's hoot. We built a noun family, and then we continued with that, uh, that noun family, the nocturnal owl's hoot, and then we described how they hoot loudly. We added an adverb. In the treetops, we added some more detail about where, or pre using a preposition, in the treetops. So now your turn, go ahead. Choose an animal and its sound, and start simple. And then modify that subject. Tell more about the subject. Once you've done that, then let's go ahead and make our predicate even more detailed and juicy. Go ahead and start making your juicy sentence now.